Hello, welcome to another edition of the Pixel Report. I'm Brian Pixel Report and live here at the famed Birdland Jazz Club here in New York City. Blessing the band stage this week, celebrating 10 years as an ensemble. Jane Bennett and McKayK are performing music from their fourth album titled Playing With Fire, which is now available on iTunes and Amazon.com. Now, for well over a decade, McKayK has stayed really enriched with the rich tradition of Afro-Cuban music by way of some of the band members who hail from the native Cuba. Jane got her love for Cuban culture by her and her husband traveling to Cuba over the last few decades and has spawned many projects celebrating the rich Afro-Caribbean and Afro-Cuban musical lifestyle and rhythms in their projects. Tonight here on The Page Support, you're going to see the official New York record release and then performing music from the new record, as well as me sitting down with Jane to talk about how this project has really manifested this group into international acclaim, as well as talk about and reflect on one of her heroes, the great Charles Mingus, in which she revises and revisits one of his compositions, Jump Monk as well as we sit down and talk about how her role as a female band leader has really been a very important love of labor as well as keeping the music and the legacy alive. So sit back, relax, and enjoy highlights of the official New York record release performance of Jane Bennett and McKayK performing music from their new album, Playing With Fire, here at the famed Birdland Jazz Club, here on The Pace Report, here in New York City.
congratulations, this brand new record, Playing With Fire. You are at the preeminent jazz cornerstone of the world, Birdland premiere in this music. Tell everybody about this fourth album. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, so we're coming up to our 10th anniversary with Mikeke, and this fourth record, um, a lot of the music was, was written during COVID, as many people for the last three years have been writing. And um, as I was working on the material and in isolation, um, you know, thinking about how, you know, how the music was going to be interpreted, it's, it's been a very different environment to, to create this next record. And also, I put the addition in of um, the wonderful uh, guitarist, uh, Donna Grandis, who was um, in Prince's last uh, um, touring group called Third Eye Girl. So she was with him for about 10 or, 10 or 12 years, up, right up until his passing. And she relocated back to Toronto. She was living in Paisley Palace, Minneapolis. And anyhow, um, she's a native a Torontonian and has been gone for many years. But we went to hear her about eight years ago. Um, we happened to be, McKeke was playing, a sh playing um, we got a call for a, a fashion designer to come and play. Uh, they were the people that did, did all the clothes for prints. Place is called Call and Response, and the clothes are like killing, you know, just beautiful. And so the band went, we happened to be, everyone was there, we were about, you know, about to go out on tour. So we went and we did this in a, impromptu sort of thing at their party, and I met Donna there, because she gets clothes from this company too. And um, she invited us, I guess about, a couple of weeks later to a show of hers and in the back of my mind I thought wow I'd love to do something with her someday but she wasn't living in Toronto at the time she was in Minneapolis and she was off touring with Prince. So anyway she came back to Toronto and um, just after COVID hit to be with family and she had a baby and um, I thought wow this would be really very interesting. I always like to when, when I do a recording to do something different. Every project for me is like embarking, it's like making a painting. I love to paint and every time I do a painting I try to do something completely different, go into a go into a space, go into some area, work with different, you know, materials, colors. Same same with make, doing recordings. So yeah, so I'm I'm super excited about this new recording. It's it's just come out this week and it's on the charts, it's number two, just be um, as as most played at the moment, or most, uh, what's it called? Um, it's most requested, or is it? Uh, what was it? There's like three things, categories in the in the thing, and it's just behind. I'm not sure if I'm saying her name, like uh, Lexia Benjamin. Okay. She's number Le one. Lakeisha Benjamin. Lakeisha. Yes. Yeah, she's number one, and and Bekeke, this new record's number two, and it's just come out this week. So excited about that. Um. Thank you. 
album, you there are so a lot of originals, but you also go, you do Bud Powell, you do Tempest Fuji, yeah, mm -hmm. and you also do Charles Mingus, you do Jump Monk. Why did you revision? Yeah. Those two concepts. Well, first of all, I've always loved Mingus. He's one of the reasons that I began playing jazz. Um, he came to Toronto a lot to a, a club called the Colonial Tavern. And um, at the time, you know, it was like something like Birdline, you have a five night run. But they, and they had an afternoon Saturday matinee. So I saw Mingus when I was about 15, 16. My dad and my brother and I went and that was the first time I'd seen Mingus a lot. My big brother had some Mingus records. And uh, so I used to go into his room and like, you know, pull records out and listen to stuff. And oh, in that time I was listening to everything from Joni Mitchell, Bob Dylan, Mingus. So it was very eclectic. But anyhow, you know, I saw Mingus and of course it was spellbound. Like it was just uh, to witness his shows where they were theatrical. And, you know, musically they were just explosive. Um, and then much later, um, when I seriously got into jazz, and so I would have been about 17, 18 years old, I was working very hard at the piano, so that was my instrument. And uh, I developed tendonitis, I had to stop the piano, and um, I was gonna have an operation, but then the doctors just said, you know, just, I, we think rest, just keeping away from the piano will be enough. So I went to San Francisco, um, I heard Mingus over the course of five, no, five nights at Keystone Corners. Wow. Yeah, I went the first night and then I went the second night. I went the, and I remember it was a very, it was so interesting because I Who was in his band? In his band was George Adams, Jack Walrath, um, of course Danny Richmond. Wow. And Don Pullen. Wow. Who I later made four records with and toured with and he became a great dear friend of mine and mentor and we did a lot of work together I really I really loved him he was a, just an incredible musician <laughs> so this, I always laugh I always laugh because I said I said to Don so many times you know you're you know you're the reason I played jazz when I saw you that night and he said don't hold that against me <laughs> but anyhow you know, um, he was a great sense of humor but um so when I returned from that trip I really wanted to play jazz but there was no jazz in universities, there was no study programs. There was, you know, stage band kind of things in the US, but that's not what I wanted to do. This whole jazz studies thing has really been, a, you know, in the last 20, 30 years, a, a new thing, but then there was nothing. So I didn't really know how to go about learning, you know, how to learn about the music, and but I did. I, I, I stepped away from the piano. I still, you know, I kept, you know, I noodled away, but it was not going to be my main instrument. And I went to the flute because I always had wanted to play it, so I picked it up when I was about 17. And, um, but that was really it. Like, the penny just dropped for me in San Francisco, hearing Mingus over that course. Um, I mean, I met Mingus. He came, like, when we, he played in Toronto, but when I'm talking 15, you know, as a 15 year old, he came over to the table and shook my father's hand and, and said, this is so nice that you brought your family out to he, you know, hear me. And he was such a gentleman. And you know, later I read his, oh, you know, this book beneath the underdog and, you know, so I <laughs> and saw the film, you know, the Mingus films and stuff like that he did. And, but um, yeah, I, I think the thing for me with Mingus, getting to your question now, but the thing with Mingus was when I heard that music, I thought that they were all classical musicians. I interpreted it because their skills were so high. And even though they were improvising, I thought their backgrounds were all classical. So I thought, well, maybe there's, a, you know, I do have a classical, maybe, but that, that, that doesn't help you. I mean, it gives you breadth. It gives you a bigger scope of the music, but improvising is a whole other thing, study and and work in a way in a, in a different direction. So anyway, the reason for the Mingus was like, I've always loved his music. I'd never had the opportunity. I did recorded one piece of his with, with Stanley Cowell on a record called Spirituals and Dedication. Yeah, yeah. You know, Stanley Cowell was, was another person who was a, very dear to me. But Ecclesiastics, I had recorded that piece. But when I heard Chop Monk and I heard the rhythmic, I thought, I have a, there's, 
it's got kind of a Cubanism to it. And and I remember Monk, uh, Mingus's uh, Cumbia Fusion, that record of his had like, it was all like Colombian music in, integrated within jazz. So I thought, well, maybe there's a chance to like, do this piece on this record. So that's the reason for Mingus. The Bud Pal, I always loved playing Bud, like, because it's intricate and hard as hell. And, um, and exciting music. And when I was learning the type of fugit, uh, I thought, well, maybe we can put a Montuno at the end of it. And the other part of that was, Dan Lano, our pianist, is an incredible classical piano player. So I got the idea to set the piece up with a Bach fugue at the beginning of it. So it's so the fugue, fugue kind of play in there. But she had to transpose the piece up a tone, which was really difficult. So she, instead of playing it in C minor, she played it in D minor, all the fingering is different, but everything that she learned. So that's the reason for the bug bell. take it back a little bit to Dizzy Gillespie, Chano Pozo, and even in the late 90s, early 2000s, Ry Cooter did the Buena Vista Social Club, where he resuscitated a lot of the Cuban musicians who had been dormant mm -hmm. for a very long yeah, time. Yeah, that was a great thing that happened. How did you get lured into loving Afro-Cuban music? Well... My pretty much instantaneous, my first trip to Cuba with my husband, who's trumpet player, Larry Kramer, um, 1982. Cheap vacation, Canadian vacation, advertised, 349, one week, to Santiago to Cuba, which is on the um, Caribbean side, on the eastern side of Cuba. And um, tourism was just opening up. So Havana was a business center. It wasn't like a place that you went to vacation, but they were opening up. Just a few properties in Santiago, like five or something. It was very small. Saw the ad, flight, hotel, three meals a day, 
what was there to lose? And so off we went, and from the first arrival, I heard the band as we were getting our bags, there was a trio playing. And then we got outside the airport, there was a quartet playing. Got on the bus an hour and a half to our hotel. There was a comparsa, which is the carnival group. So it's like, it's like, it's on drums and cornettuccina and dancers and singing. They were all going around the bus. It was like, oh my God, I'm in Africa now. I mean, this is like, I'm hearing different style after different style. I mean, boleros, then I'm hearing song montuno, then I'm hearing this comparsa. Out that night, so I'm unpacking my bags in the afternoon, cocktail hour, five o'clock. So I'm at the bar and I'm, I'm actually in my room and I'm hearing the sound and I, I think it's on the sound system. And I go, oh, I don't know. And so I came out and I walked up the hill and here was this vision, 18 guys. Like there wasn't even 18 people in the hotel. It was like a brand new hotel that just opened. It was like 10 people in the hotel. There was 18 guys all dressed in white, three trumpets. Four saxophones, two trombones, this funky cowbell, and the ink. It's like, ran back, got Larry, said, Get your horn, get your horn. We went back and we sat, and there was like four people, sat there with our sax, you know, my saxophone case, and he had his trumpet case, just like that, and the trumpet player was sort of going, Yeah. So, we unpacked our stuff and we just, we jumped in, because it would, you know, these montunos are like, improvising so I mean it was kind of it was so exciting and they invited us and we just jumped in and just started to play on these Montunos and that trumpet player that moment became, he became one of our best friends he just recently passed away about five years ago but he was a symphonic trumpet player and um, but you know popular and he knew all about the the Afro-Cuban and the religious music he was very deep you know into the Afro-Cuban those his life. So he became a mentor and um, three weeks later after that trip we went off to Havana with a handful of names of people that we should look up and then that was really that was huge because that was in the, for me the meeting of Guillermo Barreto who was like a serious, he was a Cuban drummer, timbali player but he loved swing, he loved Joe Jones so he was really into that ding -ding 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 -ding. he was was his, loved it, and uh, his wife Mercedes was probably the most um, well, deeply uh, interpreter of the Afro-Cuban religious music of the Orishas, and also popular music too. So they were a couple, and we formed this friendship with them, and they were quite a bit older than we were, but it felt like there was no age difference, you know, music's like that. So that was really, that really spiraled it, and then we had, we just continued to keep going many, many times, and then, you know, I don't know, I've made 15 records in Cuba, um, two films in Cuba, traveled the whole country, done projects and all kinds of music, from Chanqui and Guantanamo to working with Haitian music and Camagüey, right into Hokin, Matanzas with the Bomberos, so uh, those Ponquitos de Matanzas, and it's been, it's been huge. I, it, you know, it was, for me, it was two courses. I had my course of jazz, which was, you know, working like with Dewey and Don Pullen and Stanley Cowell and so many people, but at the same time, this, this thing that I was sort of doing these parallel things at the same time. I mean, I consider myself a jazz musician. I don't consider myself a aficionado of Cuban music, but it's something that I'm deeply invested in and um, uh, working with the the context of everything that that music entails. In. And so it's what, I think it's what established Larry and I musically was that partly being Canadian, partly being able to access Cuba so easily we, we got more heavily invested in that than most people would.
being from Canada and traveling with McKeke, with the musicians being from Cuba, how hard and how easy is it for you? Because I know that there's got to be some perils traveling internationally with visas. It's awful. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just stop you right there. It's <laughs> awful. It's really, really hard. Uh, that's not why you don't see a lot of people doing this. I'm Canadian. Um, it's the visa, the, the petitioning for the group to come into the U.S. is extremely costly just to get the thing rolling um, was close to $9,000 and that's not buying the visas. So, and, and because the, the group comes to Toronto and we leave from Toronto, once we enter the States we buy, you know, we have to have the visa appointments, get the visas, pay for the visas. But when we come back into Canada, we, the, vi the visas are vetoed and we have to buy new visas. So even though I petition for a period of time that might be a year, I still have to keep buying visas. Because once I go back to Canada with the musicians, it's, it's cut. So that's very costly. And right now, I mean, as I just mentioned to you, I've got a situation and I hope it gets resolved. I'm just supposed to leave in a few days for Europe. <coughs> Excuse me, and my drummer and my both of the don't have visas, they've been denied, and um, so it's really hard. It's really, really hard, and uh, I get, you know, I get very, very stressed about it, but, you know, when I get on the stage, I try and just, I really, really try and forget about it, because everybody's out there, you know, has bought a ticket. I don't, you know, you don't want, you want to give everybody the best experience you, you can, and the thing that's so incredible about McKechnie is these girls, like, they just seem to, when they hit the bandstand, know how to put it aside and have fun and play great. And then we get off the bandstand, like, what are we gonna do? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, Jane, with all of this success and all the critical acclaim that you're getting with this this music and this band. It's hard to believe that getting booked is very, very hard with this. It is, and I, tr you know, I do try to be careful not to talk about it sometimes because I, I also feel it turns presenters off because they, they, they're afraid that maybe something might happen. So, you know, especially festival people. Well, if we buy, you know, if we book this Cuban thing, they may not be able. To, they may cancel. They may not show up. So, you know, at the same time, you want people to know about it, but at the same time. You don't want them right, to right. be worried. Right, 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 you know? right, right. And then the person's like, can have a reputation if somebody drinks too much alcohol or somebody does this. And he's like, don't look it on me. Oh, he's going to be a pain in the ass. Right, right, <laughs> so, right. Yeah. So you you know, be careful. this is International Women's Month. And I have to ask you a couple of things about, you know, gender equality in the arts, especially mm. in the world of jazz, because jazz is such a small community. Yes, it is. How hard or how easy is it for you to lead an all-woman band? And what are some of the things that you have to deal with in setting the bar straight amongst your male contemporaries? Hmm. Huh. I don't, you know, when I'm with the group, I don't feel like I have to do anything because I feel like we all have each other's backs. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question correctly, but I feel with them, I feel strong and I feel, uh, you know, some of those guys are scared of these chicks. <laughs> you know, like Mary Paz and Issy, you know, don't like, don't vibe them, you know, because they're they they've been doing it for a long time, and 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 in, and in a man's world, you know, like I mean, Cuba, North America is one thing, but Cuba is a whole other kettle of fish. Really? Oh yeah, oh yeah, it, it's so super macho, it's so macho, and. Uh, a lot of people sort of, just, but it is, and I know it is, and I, I, I feel it. But you know, uh, both those, both these ladies have incredible respect because they've, they've proven themselves to be tremendous musicians, and so that they don't have that happening now, you know, in Cuba. But other people coming up, other younger women, yeah, it's there. It's there as a younger person. You because when you're younger too. You don't have the competence as you do, you know, later that you've developed. You know, you, 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 you toughen up, you, you get a thicker skin. Right. You have to and you won't survive. And, uh, and you know, I've got, there's a lot of women, you know, there's the women like, 
know the women like the Carmen McCrae's and the, the, the people, they're tough, but they've had to be tough. Right. They've had to be tough to like, to do what they, they want to do. So, um, I personally, I've always tried to surround myself, you know, Don Poulin, Dewey Redman, Stanley, there's a few guys, Billy Hart, Andrew Sorrell, so all musicians I've worked with, um, that I feel like I, I choose musicians, I, I, I put myself in an environment where I'm not subjected to uh, that kind of strange vibe. It's like choosing your friends, right? You know, so, and I've been fortunate in that I haven't, hasn't happened too much. Um, so, because I, I've not thrown myself out into a situation where I'm going to be vulnerable and possibly get hurt. But there has been some, you know, there's been a, a few things. And with, but with this group, I feel very, I feel, I think we all feel kind of safe as a unit. You know, when we go out, go out there to festivals and stuff, we're, we're tough.
has been the response musically? Has it been different playing for American audiences versus playing overseas? How's the response? Been I have particular? to say, I have to say, the American audiences are fantastic. I mean, it really, the, for, for us, it's the best audiences in the world. Colombia's Colombia was great, and Brazil's really great too. So those two, America, Brazil, and Colombia, terrific. And Germany's pretty good, but like right now, I'm being denied visa, so I'm not so happy with Germany. <laughs> <laughs> but American audiences, like when you play, when we play these festivals, I do very well with CD sales. People really respond to the to the group because when you see my cat Kate, there's like pure joy emanating out from that that stage. We have fun, we have a good time, and I think people really pick up on that vibe. What's the next direction of my cat Kate? Where do you, where you guys want to go? I don't there? know. I really don't know. I don't know yet. That'll do it again for another dish of the Facebook recording live here at the Birdland Jazz Club here in New York City. I'd like to personally thank the talented Jane Bennett and McKK for their time. Make sure you support McKK's brand new album, Playing With Fire, which is now available on iTunes and Amazon.com. For more information on their upcoming tour dates, as well as to order the CD, visit Jane online at janebennett.com. Also follow her and McKK on social media by way of Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. I'd like to personally thank the staff and management here at Birdland for their warm hospitality. As always, people, I can't stress this more than enough. Please like, share, and subscribe to the page support here on YouTube and leave comments, as well as follow me on social media by way of Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Until next time, remember if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Till next time, peace. I know we got